This is the Reading Instruction Show. I'm your host, Dr. Andy Johnson. You can see, there you go, my insignia back there. The topic of today's YouTube. I'm also going to make this a podcast. It's called Dis Research Leon. Now, did you ever notice that those people making the new laws about teaching children to read seem never to have taught children to read? Yet there they go making all the rules about reading instruction based on a whole lot of anecdotal evidence, personal experience, and a whole lot of I thinkisms. So let's take a look at real science versus fake science. The irony is in this whole science of reading debacle, debacle, that science, real science, not the fake kind used in radio documentaries is a process used to avoid I thinkisms. Real science is used to get above anecdotal evidence, beyond personal experience, and apart from I thinkisms. These all get in the way of seeing reality. So science of reading advocates are wallowing in the very thing that real science seeks to get above. That's I thinkism. What is called the science of reading is in actuality the I thinkism of reading. And here's the most unsciencey science of reading thing of all. The science of reading as a movement has determined that there was a problem. But it's a problem that wasn't because there never was a reading crisis. But this problem that wasn't was not based on any real research, but on data pulled out of context and I thinkisms. The science of reading defined the cause of the problem that wasn't. They decided the cause was not enough phonics and they determined the single solution, more phonics. Real science doesn't go around arbitrarily assigning causes and solutions to things. That is not very sciencey at all. So let's look at this research, Leah, the condition. We shouldn't make fun of those in the science of reading movement because many have a condition called dysresearchlia. Dysresearchlia is an unwillingness to read or an inability to understand reading research. It impacts three to 5% of the population and contrary to popular belief, it is not a brain disorder. That is, even though brain imaging research has shown there to be anomalies in the brains of researchliacs, with a basic educational research course, these anomalies, anomalies largely disappear. Also, scientists have proven that listening to Dr. Johnson's podcasts and YouTubes helps mitigate the effects of this research idea in 75.3% of all cases. Further, researchers have shown that Reading his books are cures for this research in 98.73% of the cases. And these are real researchers and real scientists who wear white lab coats and do commercials about toothpaste and bent carrots on TV. Not those fake ones who publish in academic journals. This research reacts make up a disproportionate number of people within the science of reading movement. There is a correlation coefficient of 0.8 between science of reading membership and this research Leah. So what are we to assume? The science of reading causes this research Leah. Just like phonemic awareness causes reading achievement, science of reading causes disresearch, Leah. Same type of reasoning. But we must look for the signs. Early diagnosis can help people with disresearch, Leah. Look for the signs. Do they start quoting Emily Hanford? Do they start talking about scientists proving things about reading? Do they start debunking things? 
Do they send you things published in Education Week or by the National Council on Teacher Quality? And do they say research says without citing any research? These are all early signs of disresearch, Leah. Another condition is called clownism. Besides disresearch, Leah, clownism is where a person begins to think they know much more about reading instruction when, in fact, they know very little. Clownism spreads from one clown and infects others and their unknowing spreads. And there is a near epidemic of clown-based unknowing within the science of reading community. And we would normally laugh at clowns. But in the case, this case, clowns are impacting real children. And it's not really very funny. Money that could be spent on things that would actually improve learning and improve reading achievement is being diverted to things that only serve to enrich big publishing. This money, millions of dollars, could be spent on healthcare, nutrition, smaller class sizes, good books, legitimate teacher professional development. These are all things that impact reading achievement much more than any reading program or method. And yet, the clownery continues. This is clown-based thinking. Well, we're just one or two reading laws away from having really good reading instruction, they say. If we're able to just insert more standards in teacher preparation programs, they say, all our reading problems will be solved, they say, and everyone will be reading above average. Phonics, they say, it's been proven. Three cueings, they say, it's been debunked. Whole language has been debunked. Balanced literacy has been debunked. The result of such clown-based thinking is that good reading teachers are being overruled, disempowered, and driven from the classroom. And the equity and achievement gap widens. It just makes sense. One of the central themes of the clown group is that children learn to read by accumulating a whole bunch of teeny tiny sounding out word reading subskills. If students just master all of these teeny tiny sounding out word reading subskills, they'll be able to put them all together and read. It just makes sense, you see. The clowns insist that young children must be taught things like diagraphs and diphthongs and vowel protectors and R-controlled vowels, syllabification, syllable types, closed syllables, accents, and the schwa sound. They must be taught these things using direct instruction with input, modeling, guided practice, independent practice, and review. And once they master all of these things, then they'll be able to read. It just makes sense, they say. To teach complex things, they say, you break them down into small little puzzle pieces and teach one little puzzle piece at a time explicitly. And after you teach all the little puzzle pieces, children are able to magically put them together and poof, just like that, they're able to read. It just makes sense. The clowns and disresearch liacs tell me it makes sense you learn to read by learning how to sound out words. And the reason children can't read, they say, is because they can't sound out words. And the reason they can't sound out words is because they aren't being taught to sound out words. And the reason they're not being taught to sound out words is because college professors like me, are not teaching their students how to teach sounding out words. And the reason why professors aren't teaching sounding out word strategies is because they're all sleeper agents intent on bringing about the downfall of capitalism, organized religion, and Western society. It just makes sense, don't you see? So let's look at real literacy researchers real literacy scholars and researchers, 
have known quite a lot of things about effective reading instruction decades before Emily Hanford poked her little head on the scene, before she appeared on a radio to teach us all about reading instruction, before Emily saved us all from our ignorance. Thank you, Emily Hanford. But here's five things that real literacy scholars and researchers know. Number one, balanced literacy instruction is effective. Real literacy scholars and researchers have known for decades that there needs to be a balance between teaching teeny tiny reading subskills and practice using them in authentic reading contexts. So in every reading class, there needs to be some direct skills instruction, but there needs to also be other stuff, including and most importantly, reading lots and lots of good books at children's independent reading level and below. Even the National Reading Panel report recommended that phonics be part of a balanced reading program. Don't believe me? Look it up. Page 2-97. So how much direct skills instruction and how much reading should be included in a balanced literacy program? Well, it depends on the students, doesn't it? Students are not standardized products. You can't say all students need this. That's not real science. That's not what real scholars and researchers have concluded. Number two, there are no reading wars. Headlines sell papers and gets hits for podcasts and YouTube videos, but it's a false binary that was made up to create chaos and confusion. Villains are identified to rally the masses. It's Ken Goodman, it's Andy Johnson. However, there are no reading wars. In academic circles among real literacy scholars, there are differences, yes, in emphasis and in theories, but this idea that you're either for phonics or a balanced literacy teacher, or you're a phonics teacher or a whole language teacher is patently absurd. And if you say those things, you are showing your ignorance for all the world to see. It's one of the greatest unknowings perpetuated by clowns and disresearch leaks. Because balanced literacy and whole language approaches both include phonics instruction. Balanced literacy includes direct and explicit in phonics instruction. Whole language approaches includes direct and explicit and systematic phonics instruction. Phonics instruction is simply one tool that's used to enable all students to become fully literate. Clowns and disresearch lacks want early reading instruction to consist primarily of direct instruction, focusing on only phonics and phonemic awareness. They're passing laws that restrict teachers to this one teaching trick. They want you to have just one tool in your teaching toolbox. Abraham Maslow once said, if the only tool you have is a hammer, all the world becomes a nail. And if the only tool you have for teaching reading is phonics instruction, all the world becomes a phonics worksheet. Third thing that scholars, real scholars and researchers know, three, passing laws about reading instruction will not be effective. We've seen this movie before. The Reading First Initiative of the early 2000s, and before that, and before that, and before that, billions of dollars and countless teacher hours were spent on nothing. The untested hypothesis proposed by the clowns and disresearch liacs is that passing massive sounding out word laws, mandating strict sounding out word instruction, like the Read Act here in Minnesota, 
will make reading achievement test scores suddenly rise like bars of ivory soap floating in the bathtub? That's the untested hypothesis based on a whole lot of I think isms. However, I'll check back with you in five years. Five years from today, June 30th, 2030. Let's take a look at the NAP data, not state criterion reference tests. These aren't good for longitudinal comparisons or state to state comparisons. NAP data uses norm reference tests. Mark your calendar, June 30th, 2030. I'll be doing a huge I told you so, but you wouldn't listen YouTube video and podcast. And I'll be laugh. I won't be laughing at you because you will have wasted millions of dollars and countless teacher hours and we will we'll have lost a generation of readers. Number four, teachers are being adequately, they are being adequately prepared to begin to learn how to teach reading. They began to learn how to teach reading. We don't create finished teaching products in any teacher preparation program. We've got three semesters plus student teaching to get students ready. In those three semesters, we've got all the education, psychology, human development stuff, reading methods, math, social studies, assessment. There's no way any teacher preparation program can create a finished teaching product in three years, let alone three semesters. Instead, we hand out learner's permits. We prepare teachers to begin the journey. And this demonstrates the need for legitimate teacher professional development. Not the slop put out there by the for-profits such as Lexia Learning and Letters, which has no research basis, but legitimate professional development for teachers. Teachers are being adequately prepared to begin to learn how to teach reading, but we can do better. We can and we must. Legitimate professional development must be part of our education programs. Number five, there is no massive reading crisis. I've alluded to this before. Comparing longitudinal NAEP reading scores since 1972 shows that reading scores have remained steady or risen slightly over time. There simply is no data to show that there is a massive reading crisis. However, this research liacs and clowns have pulled data out of context. Research has been misinterpreted or overinterpreted, and isolated studies have been used to create the illusion of a reading crisis. People have always been willing to create the illusion of a crisis to meet their own financial, economic, or political ends, and that's a sad statement. So, five big ideas. One, balanced literacy is effective. Two, there are no reading wars. Three, passing laws about reading instruction will not be effective. Four, by and large, teachers are being adequately prepared to begin to learn how to teach reading. And number five, there is no massive reading crisis. This has been the Reading Instruction Show. I'm your host, Dr. Andy Johnson. And as always, I love to hear from you. Put your comments there. If you disagree, if you disagree, that's fine. Let me see. Let me hear what you think.